I wished a round score of men in case of natives, buccaneers, or the odious French, and I had the worry of the deuce itself to find so much as half a dozen till the most remarkable stroke of fortune. I was standing on the dock when, by the merest accident, I fell in talk with him. I found he was an old sailor, kept a public house, knew all the seafaring men in Bristol, had lost his health ashore, and wanted a good berth as cook to get to sea again. He had hobbled down there that morning, he said, to get a smell of the salt. I was monstrously touched, so would you have been, and, out of pure pity, I engaged him on the spot to be ship's cook. Long John Silver, he is called, and has lost a leg. But that I regarded as a recommendation, since he lost it in his country's service, under the immortal hawk. He has no pension, lives he. Imagine the abominable age we live in. Well, sir, I thought I had only found a cook, but it was a crew I had discovered. Between Silver and myself we got together in a few days a company of the toughest old salts imaginable, not pretty to look at, but fellows by their faces of the most indomitable spirit. I declare we could fight a frigate. Long John even got rid of two out of the six or seven I had already engaged. He showed me in a moment that they were just the sort of fresh water swabs we had to fear in an adventure of importance. I am in the most magnificent health and spirits, eating like a bull, sleeping like a tree, yet I shall not enjoy a moment till I hear my old tarpaulins tramping round. Seaward, ho, hang the treasure. It's the glory of the sea that has turned my head. So now, Livesey, come post, do not lose an hour, if you respect me. Let young Hawkins go at once to see his mother, with Red Ruth for a guard. And then both come full speed to Bristol. John Trelawney postscript, I did not tell you that blandly, who, by the way, is to send a consort after us if we don't turn up by the end of August, had found an admirable fellow for sailing master. Long John Silver unearthed a very competent man for a mate, a man named Aro. I have a boatswain who pipes, lives he. So things shall go man o' war fashion on board the good ship Hispaniola. I forgot to tell you that Silver is a man of substance. I know of my own knowledge that he has a banker's account, which has never been overdrawn. He leaves his wife to manage the inn, and as she is a woman of color, a pair of old bachelors like you and I may be excused for guessing that it is the wife quite as much as the health. J. T. P.P.S. Hawkins may stay one night with his mother. J. T. You can fancy the excitement into which that letter put me. I was half beside myself with glee, and if ever I despised a man, it was old Tom Redruff, who could do nothing but grumble and lament. Any of the under gamekeepers would gladly have changed places with him, but such was not the squire's pleasure, and the squire's pleasure was like law among them all. Nobody but old Redruff would have dared so much as even to grumble. The next morning he and I set out on foot for the Admiral Benbow, and there I found my mother in good health and spirits. The captain, who had so long been a cause of so much discomfort, was gone where the wit ceased from troubling. The squire had had everything repaired, and the public rooms and the sign repainted, and had added some furniture, above all a beautiful armchair for mother in the bar. He had found her a boy as an apprentice also, so that she should not want help while I was gone. It was on seeing that boy that I understood, for the first time, my situation. I had thought up to that moment of the adventures before me, not at all of the home that I was leaving, 
and now at sight of this clumsy stranger who was to stay here in my place beside my mother i am afraid i led that boy a dog's life for as he was new to the work i had a hundred opportunities of setting him right and putting him down and i was not slow to profit by them the night passed and the next day after dinner ridruth and i were afoot again and on the road i said good-bye to mother and the cove where i had lived since i was born and the dear old admiral benbow since he was repainted no longer quite so dear one of my last thoughts was of the captain who had so often strode along the beach with his cocked hat, his sabre-cut cheek, and his old brass telescope. Next moment we had turned the corner and my home was out of sight. The mail picked us up about dusk at the Royal George on the Heath. I was wedged in between Ridruth and a stout old gentleman, and in spite of the swift motion and the cold night air, I must have dozed a great deal from the very first, and then, where are we? I asked. Bristol, said Tom. Get down. Mr. Trelawney had taken up his residence at an inn far down the docks to superintend the work upon the schooner. Thither we had now to walk, and our way, to my great delight, lay along the quays and beside the great multitude of ships of all sizes and rigs and nations. In one, sailors were singing at their work. In another, there were men aloft, high over my head, hanging to threads that seemed no thicker than a spitter's. Though I had lived by the shore all my life, I seemed never to have been near the sea till then. The smell of tar and salt was something new. I saw the most wonderful figureheads that had all been far over the ocean. I saw, besides many old sailors, with rings in their ears, and whiskers curled in ringlets, and tarry pigtails, and their swaggering clumsy sea walk and I was going to see myself, to see in a schooner, with a piping boatswain and pigtailed singing seamen to sea, bound for an unknown Iceland, and to seek for buried treasure. Here you are, he cried, and the doctor came last night from London. Bravo, the ship's company complete. Oh, sir, cried I, when do we sail? Sail, says he. We sail tomorrow ate at the sign of the spy-glass when i had done breakfasting the squire gave me a note addressed to john silver at the sign of the spy-glass and told me i should eat. i set off overjoyed at this opportunity to see some more of the ships and seamen and picked my way among a great crowd of people and carts and bales for the dock was now at its busiest it was a bright enough little place of entertainment the sign was newly painted the windows had neat red curtains. The floor was cleanly sanded. There was a street on each side and an open door on both, which made the large, low room pretty clear to see in, in spite of clouds of tobacco smoke. The customers were mostly seafaring men, and they talked so loudly that I hung at the door, almost afraid to enter. As I was waiting, a man came out of a side room, and at a glance I was sure he must be Long John. His left leg was cut off close by the hip, and under the left shoulder he carried a crutch, which he managed with wonderful dexterity, hopping about upon it like a bird. He was very tall and strong, with a face as big as a ham plain and pale, but intelligent and smiling. Indeed, he seemed in the most cheerful spirits, whistling as he moved about among the tables, with a merry word or a slap on the shoulder for the more favoured of his guests. Now, to tell you the truth, from the very first mention of Long John and Squire Trelawney's letter, I had taken a fear in my mind that he might prove to be the very one-legged sailor whom I had watched for But one look at the man before me was enough. I had seen the captain, and black dog, and the blind man, Pew, and I thought I knew what a buccaneer was like a very different creature, according to me, from this clean and... I plucked up courage at once, crossed the threshold, and walked right up to the man where he stood propped on his crutch, talking to a customer. Mr. Silver, sir. I asked, holding out the note. Yes, my lad, 
said he such is my name to be sure and who may you be and then as he saw the squire's letter he seemed to me to give something almost like a start oh said he quite loud and offering his hand i see you are our new cabin boy pleased i am to see you and he took my hand in his large firm grasp just then one of the customers at the far side rose suddenly and made for the door it was close by him and he was out in the street in a moment but his hurry had attracted my notice and i recognized him at glance it was the tallow-faced man wanting two fingers who had come first to the admiral benbow oh i cried stop him it's black dog i don't care two coppers who he is cried silver but he hasn't paid his score harry run and catch him one of the others who was nearest the door leaped up and started in pursuit if he were admiral hawk he shall pay his score cried silver and then relinquishing my hand who did you say he was he asked black what dog sir said i has mr trelawney not told you of the buccaneers he was one of them so cried silver in my house ben run and help harry one of those swabs was he was that you drinking with him morgan step up here the man whom he called morgan an old gray-haired mahogany-faced sailor now morgan said long john very sternly you never clapped your eyes on that black black dog before did you now not i sir said morgan with you didn't know his name did you no sir by the powers to morgan it's as good for you exclaimed the landlord if you had been mixed up with the like of that you would never have put another foot in my house you may lay to that and what was he saying to you i don't rightly know sir answered morgan do you call that a head on your shoulders or a blessed dead eye cried long john don't rightly know don't you perhaps you don't happen to rightly know who you was speaking to perhaps come now what was he joing the ages captain's ship's pipe up keel hauling was you and a mighty suitable thing too and you may lay to that get back to your place for a lubber tom and then as morgan rolled back to his seat silver added to me in a confidential whisper that was very flattering as i thought and now he ran on again aloud let's see black dog no i don't know the name not i yet i kind of think i've yes i've seen the swab he used to come here with a blind beggar he used that he did you may be sure said i i knew that blind man too his name was pew it was cried silver now quite excited pew that were his name for certain ah he looked a shark he did if we run down this black dog now there'll be news for cap trelawney ben's a good runner few seamen run better than ben he should run him down hand over hand by the powers he talked o keel hauling did he i'll keel haul him all the time he was jerking out these phrases he was stumping up and down the town my suspicions had been thoroughly reawakened on finding black dog at the spy-glass and i watched the cook narrowly but he was too deep and too ready and too clever for me and by the time the two men had come back out of grief and confessed that they had lost the track in a crowd and been scolded like the see here now hawkins said he here's a blessed hard thing on a man like me now ain't it there's cap trelawney what's he to think here i you are a lad you are but you are as smart as paint i see that when you first come in now here it is what could i do with this old timber i hobble on when i was in a master mariner i'd have come up alongside of him hand over hand and broached him the score he burst out three goes o oh rum why shiver my timbers if i hadn't forgotten my score and falling on a bench he laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks i could not help joining and we laughed together peal after peal until the tavern rang again 
Why, what a precious old sea calf I... What am he said at last, wiping his cheeks? You and me should get on well. Hawkins, for I'll take my davia. I should be rated ship's boy. But come now, stand by to go about. This want do. Duty is duty, messmates. I'll put on my old cockerel hat, and step along of you to Cap Trelawney, and report this here affair. For mind you, it's serious, young Hawkins, and neither you nor me's come out of it with what I should make so bold as to call credit. Nor you neither says you not smart none of the pair of us smart. But dash my buttons, that was a good un about my score. And he began to laugh again, and that so heartily, that though I did not see the joke as he did, I was again obliged to On our little walk along the quays, he made himself the most interesting companion, telling me about the different ships that we passed by, their rig, tonnage, and nationality, explaining I began to see that here was one of the best of possible shipmates. When we got to the inn, the squire and Dr. Livesey were seated together, finishing a quart of ale with a toast in it, before they should go aboard the schooner on a visit of inspection. Long John told the story from first to last, with a great deal of spirit and the most perfect truth. That was how it were now, weren't it Hawkins? He would say, now and again, and I could always bear him entirely out. The two gentlemen regretted that Black Dog had got away, but we all agreed there was nothing to be done, and after he had been complimented, Long John took up his crutch and departed. All hands aboard by four this afternoon, shouted the squire after him. A, a sir, cried the cook of the passage. Well, squire, said Dr. Livesey, I don't put much faith in your discoveries as a general thing. But I will say this, John Silver suits me. The man's a perfect trump, declared the squire. And now, added the doctor, Jim may come on board with us, may he not? To be sure he may, says Squire. Take your hat, Hawkins, and we'll see the ship. Nine powder and arms the Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships. And at last, however, we got alongside, and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you, said he. I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope. All shipshape and seaworthy well. Sir, said the captain, better speak plain. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship. You quired the squire very angry, as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft. More I can't say. Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer either, says the squire. But here, doctor, Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he, stay a bit. No use of such questions as that but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much, or he has said too little, and I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise. Now, why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders, to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me, said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair. Now do you? No, said Dr. Livesey, I don't, Dex, said the captain. I learn we are going after treasure here from my own hands, 
mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them, above all, when they are secret and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot, asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about, but I'll tell you my way of it, life or death, and a close run. That is all clear. And I dare say, Levesy, we take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett. And I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands, if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should, perhaps, have taken you along with him. But the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow, I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself. Shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain. Only that he's too familiar. Well, now, and the short and long of it, captain, asked the doctor. Tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you've heard me very patiently, saying things that I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then, you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here beside the cabin? Second point. Any more? Asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett. That you have a map of an island. That there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is and that the island lies. I never told that, cried the squire. To a soul, the hands know it, sir returned the captain. Lovesy, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was, replied the doctor. And I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was so loose a talker. Yet in this case I believe he was really right, and that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point, it shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people, and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offense, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same. All may be for what I know, but I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man Jack aboard of her. I see things going as I think, not quite right. And I ask you to take certain precautions or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile, did ever you hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you when you came in here, I'll stake my wig. You meant more than this. Doctor, said the captain, you are smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. 
Had Libsy not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you. I will do as you desire, but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, I believed you have managed to get two honest men on board with you, that man and John Silver. Silver, a row stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after part of the main hold, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and fork. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Ridruth and I were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew, but that is only guess, for as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing so ho, mates, says he, what's this? We rear a changing of the powder, Jack answers, one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John, if we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. A, I, sir, answered the cook, and touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of his galley. That's a good man, captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. Easy with that, men, easy. He ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder. And then, suddenly observing me examining the swivel, we carried amidships, a long brass knot. Ten the voyage all that night we were, in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place, and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Landley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the cap. I might have been twice as wary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me, the brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places. Now, barbecue, tip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one cried another. A, A, mates, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen. Even at that exciting moment it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the answer was short up. Soon it was hanging dripping at the bows. Soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. And before I am not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship. The crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which required to be known. Mr. 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 Red cheeks, stuttering tongo, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. 
Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober and attend to his... In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased. We could do nothing to solve it. And when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober deny solemnly that he ever...